morning, good morning. How are you? I said, how are you? Clearly we need some more caffeine in the building. Some of you are a little sleepy. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. You'll get used to me, and just as you get used to me, I'm about to leave, so. Before I dive into what I um, think God's asked me to share with you this morning, I wanna say thank you for being so um, welcoming. And uh, I think this is the first time, I don't know if I've ever been at this part of the world before, um, Grand Rapids, maybe I have one time, but certainly my first time with the Link family. And so I wanna thank you for your welcome and thank you for your encouragement. And um, you know, when you meet new groups of people, it takes a little while to get used to each other. And some of you are like, why does she have a funny voice? And it's all good. You all have the funny voice, but that's okay. And but you know, we're one family, we're building the kingdom of God. I have the privilege of doing that in the UK where I'm in the church there pastoring alongside an incredible team. And I'm in a city that is 55% um, Muslim. And uh, we have a lot of work on our hands with reaching people for Christ. We have um, mosques either side of our building and uh, all our street signs near where our building is are in Urdu. And, uh, and so we're right in the Michel field, right there in England. And same with our work in Ireland, same with Poland. And so, you know, God's using us all to play a part in the big picture of what he's called us to do. And we all have a job to get on and do. But when we get to come together like this, it's good to know that you're not alone, that you're part of something way bigger than sometimes you may realize. And so I, just like last night, want to pray before I speak. I am a lover of the Word of God. I make no apology for it. And uh, because I've decided that you just have adopted me as an extra family member for these next few hours, I'm gonna to speak to you as if you are family. Um, I like to say I'm not a wow preacher. Um, that's the anointing God put on some people's lives that they preach and you're like, wow, wow, wow. And they get you all excited and you're like, you're gonna swing from the chandeliers if there was one, you know, and you wanna charge hell with a squirt gun and you're just excited because they were awesome. And, that's not the anointing God gave me. God made me more of an owl preacher. Just take a W off and we're all good. And so it'll be more owl than wow, but I realized a long time ago that the Word of God has candy in it, great stuff for your soul, things that are sweet, things that just pick you up in those seasons when you need it. But the Word of God also has a lot of greens in it. In fact, it has more greens than candy. And I think we gotta bring the greens back into the house of God and not be frightened to talk about the greens because unless we feed our people greens, they won't grow up to have the stature and the maturity that we need them to have. So we're about to have some greens, which means I know it's early to have greens and you probably want a cinnamon roll instead, but I'm pretty sure you can get one of those somewhere else. But let's just prepare our hearts, hey. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you love us so much, that you don't leave us as we are. God, you're always committed to bring out the best in us. And God, I thank you that the wiser we become, the more we realize that God, it's your correction in our lives that makes the greatest difference to our lives. For without the pruning, there is no new budding. Without the cutting off, there is no new growth. And God, I pray that we would surrender all over again in this season of our lives to the pruning that you need to do. God, however good it looks on the outside, God, I pray we will give you permission to cut what is unnecessary on the inside. God, make us fruitful. But God, as we even utter those words and say, use us and make us fruitful, we also have a maturity to know that means one thing, which means in the flourishing, there is a cutting. In the growth, there is a letting go. In the stepping forward, there is a releasing. So God, bring a release and a peace and a willingness you are the great gardener of our lives and of our churches. And we love you and we thank you for it. 
God, I pray I would get out of the way so that you can have your way. Amen and amen. You may take your seats. Well, I did give you a little bit of an advance warning that we're going to have some greens this morning. And uh, I know I'm talking to church leaders, church builders, and so when you're around church leaders and church builders, I, I, I love it because it means we can cut out all the stuff and get right down to what needs to be said. And uh, I, I want to talk to you uh, this morning, and before I get into the title of what I feel God's asked me to speak on, and I want you to know that I am not a circuit preacher. I have been blessed by God and given incredible opportunities to go and speak to some incredible places, but I take all of them very seriously because I understand whenever you step foot on a platform, you are stepping foot onto something that someone has labored for, someone has built, someone has laid their life down for. So to come and do my thing would be about me. I want to come and do God's thing. So I prayed a lot about what I would share over these three times that I've spoken with you so that I hope it will become something that's helpful and useful for you you in the journey that you are on. And I want to kind of back up first of all, and, and this is kind of a pivotal message. It was in my life, and I think it's probably one of the core messages that I believe every leadership team should probably get a hold of. So if you're a leader here today and you have a team, I would say this message would be good food even to take back to your team. Start by looking at a story in the Bible that is really unusual. It's I love when you find stories in the Bible, you're like, what is that there for? You know, you ever read one of those stories and you're like, of all the things that could have been recorded, really? You want to record that? And so it makes me really curious of why that story is in the Bible, because I'm like, you know, it's not like, it's like there's one book here. So, so these stories all have a reason for being there. There's nothing incidental or accidental. And so this story is in Two Kings 4, and it's actually become one of my very favorite stories. And the crazy thing, it's about a guy making some stew. You're like, I don't even like stew that much. But I'm going to read this story to you, and then I want to pull out something in this that then I want to teach from. And the title is Death in the Pot. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region while the company of the prophets was meeting with him. He said to his servant, put on the large pot and cook some stew for these prophets. One of them went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild vine and picked as many of its gourds as his garment could hold. And when he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, Man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. Elisha said, Get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, Serve it to the people. There is nothing harmful in the pot. I pondered a lot about this story, and I want to first of all pick out some things about this story before I dive into what I want to put in your hands today. I love this story for many, many reasons. First of all, I love that this prophet, this man of God, was going to go teach some younger prophets. But I love that before he taught, he realized there's a need here. Everybody is hungry. There's even a lesson in that for some of us preachers and leaders that just want to do our thing. But let me tell you, if people are hungry for something and you're just doing your latest, greatest sermon, they ain't thinking about what you're saying. They're thinking about what their stomach is longing. And so he goes to the prophets and he says, let's put a large pot on and let's cook, cook some stew. And as he gives that instruction, I guess one of the younger prophets, I think in my mind he was probably the zealous one. You have one of those guys on your team or girls on your team, the one that always wants to impress, the one who wants to go and tell you the latest testimony of the thing that they did, and they want to let you know of the good report, and they want to let you know how, how productive they've been. And I think he was that one in the team. And, and this guy, he rushes out, and he says he goes and he finds all these gourds, and he finds all these vines, and he finds all these herbs, and he just loads up his apron, and he's excited that he's done what the prophet asked and he rushes back to where they're getting the stew ready and he just chops it up and throws the whole thing in the pot. 
You know, that's what empowerment looks like in a church. It looks like you empowering leaders to bring something to the pot that is the church that you're building. It looks like letting them have the freedom to bring the idea, letting them have a go at trying something, letting them bring something to contribute to the pot. And the empowerment means that sometimes what happened in this story will happen in your story, which is that not everything that went in the pot was great. Not everything that went in the pot was the best quality. But in the zeal and in the enthusiasm, this young guy throws his bit in, contributes to what's being built, says, I want to put something in. It goes in the pot. And before you know it, it's in the mix of the pot. And now everybody sat down to eat the stew. And as they eat the stew, they begin to taste it. And all of a sudden, somebody shouts, Oi! Hey! Something in here is not good. Something's off. Oh, for that kind of team. Oh, for the kind of team that when something in the pot is off, we don't go on a witch hunt for who put it in the pot. We just shout out, hey, I think we need to do something about what's in the pot. I don't know how it got in there, I don't know who put it in there. I don't really care. All I know is what we're tasting is not what we should be tasting. So I wonder if there's anything we can do about the stew. When you get a team around you, you gotta tell them that empowerment looks like there will be times when things get put in the pot that are not quite the flavor of who we are or what we are. Sometimes things get put in the pot and the tone's a little off or the attitude's a little funky. Sometimes conversations happen in the pot. They're a little stressful or a little heated. It's called building church. And at that point when that happens... As leaders, you need to have a maturity and a wisdom to know what to do next and to teach your team and to teach those around you to be able to have the freedom to say, I don't think something tastes right. I think something is a little off. Instead of having private conversations behind one another's backs about what they don't like that's in the park, that doesn't help anybody. That just breathes division. Oh, I know we just held hands and we sang Kumbaya and we're united. And I love that. But when the hands drop, you've got to walk that thing out. You can't just pray for your brother and sister in a moment in worship. You've got to walk out a, a relationship where actually what you prayed is what you live. We've got to raise our teams that we're empowering. Look, we want you all to contribute. We want everybody to have a, have a go. We want you to be able to put in your gift and your talent. Some of you got such a long list before anybody can even speak. And that's why they've gone to start their own church. And that's why they're doing their own thing in the youth department. And that's why they're going off doing their own mission thing because they feel they'll never be allowed to put anything in the pot. So we've got to just say, hey, I'm empowering you, throw it in the pot. But then we've also got to say, but the flip side of that is can we all agree that when something's off, we just say it. Nobody gets offended. Nobody has an attitude. Nobody's upset. We just go, hey, something's off. The vibe's off. The tone's off. Now, this is what I'm really wanting you to see. Because when they say that, I love the wisdom of the prophet of God. Because they shout, something's off. Man of God, there is death in the pot. Listen to this. Elisha doesn't say, oh, really? Tell me about it. Go bring all your friends. Let's have a five-hour meeting about the death in the pot. Let's interrogate people and find out who put the death in the pot. Let's fire a few people that put death in the pot. Let me preach some messages on Sunday about death in the pot. And you may die if you put death in the pot, says the Lord. 
Let's get stricter about our policies with who puts things in the pot. Let's start to filter everybody's contribution to the pot. He simply says this, go get me some flour. Flour? Go get me some flour. Okay. And he gets some flour and he puts it in the pot and then he says, go ahead, carry on eating. It's all good. Like that scene in Star Wars. It was like a Jedi move. <laughs> Nothing to see here. It's all good. <laughs> he didn't say, which we do over and over again which the enemy is sat witnessing us do and going, I don't need to do anything. They're doing my job for me. Here's what we do. When someone says the death in the pot, the stew's got something in it that doesn't taste good. We don't say, go get me flour. We say, well, let's throw the stew away then. Have to start all over again. Was to start build the department again, employ different people, step down those people. We're going to have to start all over again. And in that one decision, you throw away years and years and hours and hours of time and investment and labor, all because you did not have the wisdom to say, get me some flour. And I have watched churches throw things away that were never the issue because they were unwilling instead to find flour to fix the issue. And I want to say to every leader in here, get some flour in your pocket. Carry flour in your pocket. Flour of forgiveness, flour of grace, flour of wisdom, flour of discernment. Get some flour in your pocket so when someone says there's something in the pot that's not good, you say, it's okay, chill out, don't panic. I got this, God's got this. Bring it to me. I'm just going to put some grace in it. I'm going to put some prayer in it. I'm going to put some fasting in it. I'm going to put some discernment in it. And you know what? When we've done all of that, it's all good. Carry on eating. Let's not waste what we don't need to waste. And so for the next 20 minutes that I have with you, because that was the introduction, <laughs> I want to put some flour in your pocket. I want to give you some flour for some seasons that you may have to journey to hopefully help you make a better choice. I wish the flour I'm about to give you, someone had given me earlier in my ministry. I wish someone had taken the time on a platform to not preach at me, but to just kind of eyeball me and say, you need to know a few things. But this was not a subject that was really talked about when I was growing up in ministry, so I've had to discover this flower for myself. But today, I wanna save you the pain of finding it out for yourself because that's what our job is. When I find something, I'm supposed to tell you, and when you find something, you're supposed to tell me, you're supposed to keep it for yourself. Hello. So I wanna to talk to you about pain. <laughs> I did warn you we're having greens this morning before you get mad at me. And I want to give you this title, and I hope it sticks in your mind, because no one told me this. I knew that there was pain. The Word of God says that there will be trouble on this journey. You don't ever see it on a fridge magnet or a tea towel, but it is a promise of God. It's one of the least popular ones. So, so we know there's trouble. We know that when we step out to serve God, there will be times of persecution and there'll be times of discomfort and there'll be times of pain. We read the disciples' life. We read those that were the heroes in the faith and you can't escape the fact that there's pain. And so 
If you didn't know it, newsflash, if you chose to be a leader, the day you said yes to God, you also said yes to pain. Aren't you glad about that? You can leave the room now if this message is not what you came for. But no one ever told me this, that you can pick your pain. So the flower I want to put in your pocket today is a lesson that I have learned through some seasons of my life in transition and change in some personal relational areas that I've had to journey. I have lived this message out. I have understood that, Charlotte, you have a choice. The flower in your pocket is up to you. You can either get really mad or you can pick your pain. The best way to describe this, uh, two options that we have, is by telling you a funny story that happened a couple of years back now. We have really good friends, uh, my best friend of 37 years, her and her husband, we've journeyed a long time with and raised our kids together. But one of the differences in what we like to do is that when it comes to time off vacation, I like to rest, they like to ski. They consider climbing up a mountain, putting a ton of clothes on, carrying skis, throwing yourself off a cliff, fun. I don't. So I had never skied, but my husband is from Washington State and he grew up skiing. So he loves to ski. So this conversation over all of these years has gone on, when will you finally go ski? When will you finally go ski? And I have resisted, resisted, resisted. You go ski. I'll pay for you to go ski. I'll bless my husband with a boy's skiing trip. The kids can come with you. I have done everything to avoid going. But there was one night several years back where I guess my persistence was low, my energy was low, and in a moment of weakness, they pulled up some pictures of beautiful mountains, showed me a beautiful lodge, and said, your kids would really, really appreciate you saying yes. What kind of mother are you to not fulfill their dreams? And as they wore me down, and it was late at night, the words came out of my mouth, okay. Now the next morning when I woke up, I was like, I can take those words right back. I am now in my right mind. I will not be blackmailed. But to my shock and horror, they had taken my okay. And when we left their home that night at midnight, they had gone online and booked the chalet. We were locked in financially. There was no escape. I was going skiing. We got to the ski place, it was terrible conditions, they'd had no fresh snow, it was sheet ice under tiny bit of snow, they were making fake snow. So everything was not going my way. And I remember after about a day out on the slopes, my kids who could barely ski were just pitifully embarrassed of me. And they just turned to me and went, Mom, this is so embarrassing. You're like snow plowing and you're like in your 40s and like... There's like kids that are like three past, passing you up. And so, Mum, I know you paid for us all to have lessons together, but you guess what? We're going to give you the instructor all for yourself because we're going with Dad. So they basically ditched me. And I just had this moment. I'm like, you know what? I have a fear of heights. I don't like heights. I guess I don't like being out of control. And so all those things were all coming together. And I just had this moment. I was like, you know what? I'm going to beat this. I'm going to beat this. And I was on my own. So I got in the ski lift with my skis, and I went right to the top of the mountain. I was singing hymns all the way up there. I was like, Lord, if this is the last time I ever talk to you this way, and next time's face to face, I just want you to know I love you. <laughs> Take care of my kids. I'm having all these conversations in my head. I get up. I'm on my own. I'm on my own. I've learned enough to kind of get me down the mountain, but I, the conditions were bad. I've clicked my feet in my skis. I get on the skis and I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm like snow plowing down the, down the top of the mountain. So I'm coming down the top of the mountain and I'm picking up speed and I'm like freaking out. I'm like, I can't remember what you do. What do you do to slow down? I can't, I can't remember. And it's all like, and now I'm panicking and, and then I hear like ice underneath my skis. I'm like, this is a bad idea, but I'm already going down the mountain. And I'm like, okay, if I can just, just get down the mountain, just get down the mountain. As all this is going through my head and I'm picking up speed, I round the corner like... <laughs> And as I round the corner, my worst nightmare 
is in front of me. Because right at the top of the mountain, round the corner, there was a ski school for four-year-olds. <laughs> who were all, at that exact moment in time, practicing the snowplow which meant every child was holding on to the pole of the other child, and they were doing a big zigzag down that part of the mountain. Round the corner comes kamikaze Englishwoman, completely out of control. And I see these four-year-olds, and I have a split second. And in that split second, I know pain is coming. There is no avoiding pain. Pain is in my future, but in this split second, I get to pick my pain. Because over to the left, I could see a big pile of snow, and several children were all around the front of that pile of snow. And I realized if I go to the left, I'm going to land in the snow. I will take several children out on the way, but I will lessen the pain. And on the right, I spotted two children who had dropped the pole between them, opening up the smallest of gaps. And I was like, I have no idea what's at the other side of those two children. It, the cliff just seemed to drop off. But if I take that opening, no one else will get hurt. And in that split second, I had two choices. Which pain would I pick? I said a prayer, I veered to the gap, put my head down, and went flying through these two children, down the side where there was no snow, hit a few rocks, bashed my head, but I was alive. Pain was gonna be in my future. But in that moment, I had to pick my pain. And though the analogy is a ski slope, and though the analogy is snow and children, as leaders in ministry, you will come to that point in your ministry time after time after time where you know pain is in my future. There's a decision that's going to cause some pain. There's a conversation that's going to cause some pain. There's a situation I'm handling, and it's painful right now in my personal life to even have to handle this. And you, in that moment, have two choices. And I call those two choices this. One is collateral damage, and two is private pain. And I wish I could stand here on this platform and not have to preach this message because we all do well and choose the other option that I took that day. But the sad truth is that so many people, so many times, choose collateral damage when they see pain in their future. Collateral damage was not just me getting injured, but it was children that were innocent being injured. Collateral damage when you're a leader is not just you taking a hit. It's the team that didn't even know about it taking the hit. It's the congregation God entrusted you with taking the hit. It's the testimony of other people's lives taking the hit. And we don't want all the time to have to disappear, as it were, into a place where we absorb pain when it wasn't even our fault. But God has called us as leaders to pick our pain and my prayer is that you would get some flour in your pocket and begin to pick the right kind of pain because God is a healer and God is a restorer, but we are causing oftentimes so much collateral damage and it's not on God, it is on us to fix the bones that we broke with our poor choices. So I want to give you a couple of differences in these two pains. So the next time you find yourself in ministry or in leadership at the top of a mountain, as it were, with pain facing you and choices to be made, maybe these two options will come to mind. And maybe by me defining them a little more, you'll know which one looks like which. I think collateral damage versus personal pain is the choice between retaliation or preservation. Luke 22, verse 49. Jesus 
He's with the disciples. And they come in to grab a hold of Jesus, to take him. And Peter, in that moment, he knows pain's coming. And in that moment, all of the emotions were going through him like they go through us in those moments. Pain's coming. It's not fair. It's not right. There's going to be hurt. I'm going to have loss. All those things were going through his mind. And in that moment, he grabs his sword. Remember? And he cuts the ear off one of the soldiers because that's what retaliation does. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm annoyed. So I'm just going to say it. I don't like what's going on and I don't like what you did to me. So I'm just going to retaliate. And he cuts the ear off. And Jesus looks at Peter and he looks at the ear. And Jesus goes and puts the ear back on the soldier's head. Peter, I know pain's coming, but on the way to the pain I must face, we don't need to deface anyone else. Remember the story of how John the Baptist died? If you don't, you should go back and read it. Because Herodias was a woman that was offended by some things that John the Baptist had said. And she would not let it go. She was insulted, she was offended. And when her husband lay his head down at night on the pillow next to her, she would tell him, you need to deal with that guy. You need, to, you need to kill that guy. And so just to keep her quiet, he imprisoned John. But there's a part of that story where it says her daughter was summoned to go and dance and entertain all the men. And as she entertained the men, she was asked up to half of the kingdom, what can I give you? She runs to her mother, Herodias, and says to her mother, I can ask for up to half the kingdom. What shall I ask for? And her mother, who was offended, said, go get me the head of John the Baptist. A generation with an opportunity to do good to up to half the kingdom asks an older person that they look to and they trust. What should I use my opportunity for? And the hurt and the offense opens its mouth and says, go get me the head. You know, we have churches all around the world that have the heads of ex-members on the wall, the heads of people that they took down with their comments, the heads of people they didn't like, and so they made sure no one else liked them. And while we have our trophy room of heads from our offenses, we have turned down the opportunity to go and reach up to half of the kingdom. Pick your pain. It's not fair. I wish it was another way. But the maturity has to come to the forefront and the immaturity has to die. And we must get flour in our pocket that says, I want to preserve life, not retaliate against life. There was another time in Luke 9 when the disciples felt that they had been dishonored. When they hadn't welcomed Jesus in the way that they thought they should welcome him. When they'd not been greeted in the way that they felt they should have been greeted. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, shall we call down fire and burn the suckers up? <laughs> Let's be honest, we all have those days. God, could you just... Could you just deal with it? Could you just burn that sucker up? Could you just take care of that situation? Because retaliation's real. It's part of your human flesh saying, let's do it this way. And in the amplified version of that story, it says, Jesus turns to them and says, don't you know that's not the spirit that you're from? It's not who we are. I didn't come here to retaliate. My enemy, I came to love my enemy. I didn't come here 
to play a game. I came to save souls. And as a leader, you're going to have those moments when retaliation is an option. But my appeal to you today is that the flower in your pocket will be that your desire and your urgency for preservation will be far greater than your need to have retaliation. How do you know the difference when you're picking your pain? Collateral damage is retaliation. Private pain goes for preservation. How do you know the difference between these two? Collateral damage is all about self. But personal pain is all about serve. I'm sure you've been in the scenario if you've been building church for any length of time. Maybe there's death in the pot and there's something that's a little off. And so you begin to try and put things right and you begin to make some suggestions and maybe make some changes. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, someone is going to start fighting for their department. They have an agenda that they feel is actually more important than the bigger agenda. That actually pain is in the future and what they're saying is, no, I want my way, I want my department to do this, I want it to look like this, I want it to sound like this, because I know pain's coming, but I'm going to protect what I am personally passionate about. Self causes collateral damage. It causes division. It means I'm going to protect my group against the bigger group. It means I'm going to pull in ranks with my people, even though, God, you've called me to be amongst all these people. It means I'm going to fight for my corner rather than fight for the cause. It means I'm on the team when the team serves me, but I'm not on the team when the team's not doing what I want the team to do. No team is team. And sometimes a team will bless your world, and sometimes a team will annoy your world. But team is team. Try that in your family. Well, I'm only in this family if we eat what I like, watch what I like. I'm only in this family if you keep the noise level at the level I like. We're only in this family if I get to spend the budget on what I want before the family gets what's left over. Try that in your household. Let's see how united you are. So why do we think that it's going to fly in God's household? No, it's not. We've got to get flour in our pocket and understand that we're all wired differently. And that's what makes us brilliant together. But there'll come a point when there's pain in your future, and sometimes that pain might look like you don't get to do what you wanted to do so that someone else can get to do what they need to do. You choose self or serve. Collateral damage looks like denial. Personal pain looks like ownership. You ever raised any children? Ever had anything go wrong, say a broken window or something happens, and so you pull the kids in, you're like, who did it? Want me, want me, want me. Everybody is denying. So what does that make you do as a parent? It makes you punish all the children. Well, until someone admits it, you're all grounded. Well, until someone says they did it, you're all going to bed early. And now the whole group are punished because no one will say it was me. But when you're a parent and one of your kids goes, it was me, you, you don't want to slap them, you want to hug them. Because they just saved you hours of time disciplining children that did nothing wrong. You're like, I'm just glad you said you did it. Thank the Lord. Okay, we can move on. Some of you have no idea you're making the pain so much worse by your denial. You'd make it so much more healing with your ownership. I did it. I spoke out of turn. I gossiped. I hurt you. It's on me. I don't want collateral damage by being in denial. I want to take ownership while I can. Time's going. I'm going to 
condense and rush through this last couple of points because I want to give you them all. Collateral damage. This is huge, people. Listen to me. This is huge. This is an epidemic right now in our churches because of the age that we live in of technology. This has never been a bigger issue. Collateral damage looks like public sympathy. And private pain is what you do when it's personal, the choice you're making. There has never been a time when you can get more public sympathy for your side of the story than there is now. Don't tell me you don't see it. The Instagram post, the uses of scripture to justify a stinking behavior. And then all the people that also have the same behavior put all their comments underneath, preach it bro, with you bro. You go for your dreams, bro. I wanna get on there and go, you bros need your heads bashing together. <laughs> I'll just put a Facebook post out about control in the church. Okay. What might have been better is if you'd have taken some flour in your pocket and said, can I talk about an area where I'm feeling a little disempowered? But now you posted it and hundreds of people are reading it and everybody's wondering what you're really saying behind what you're saying. And now we've got collateral damage going on because everybody's now watching what you're doing. I'm not hurting anyone. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Think about Jesus. At a moment when he could have gone for public sympathy. At the moment when he's about to face the worst pain imaginable. He's at the top of the mountain as it were. The point of pain is before him. The cross is before him. In that moment he had every, every right to go for public sympathy and say, I'm about to die and you're, you're shouting crucify me. I healed your kid. I delivered your demon. I came to your town and I set you free. I taught you so that you could have freedom. I went without food. I went without sleep. I gave all I had. He could have in that moment of pain gone for so much public sympathy and he would have earned every single one of those statements. But at the moment of pain, in a garden away from anybody's eyes, with no cameras, no Instagram, no news report, no spreading the word, in agony of soul, he says, not my will, but yours be done. I choose this private pain for the bigger gain. I choose to take on this cross for the bigger gain. He is our example. And let me tell you this. When you choose that pain, I have to say, it's not that it doesn't hurt. I've been through things personally in relationships, people that I thought that would be there for me, people I thought that would help me, people that I thought would stand by me, and they're nowhere to be seen. And I've had every opportunity to say things, to post things. But I've understood I'm going to have to endure some personal pain. And personal pain hurts. When I went through the gap on that mountain, don't you think I wasn't hurt? I was hurt. Those bumps, they took me out. And as I came through, I got up and I felt dizzy and I felt a little confused. Personal pain hurts. But personal pain, when you choose it, for the bigger gain of saving the stew, does something in you that is spectacular. 
I wonder if we could put the verse on the screen that I wanna close with. It's in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. And I wanna read it to you from the Message Bible because I want you to see what the Bible says about this kind of pain. Distress, pain, that drives us to God does just that. It turns us around. It gets us back in the way of salvation. We will never regret that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets and end up on a deathbed of regrets. And now, check this out, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this pain has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, you're more concerned, you're more sensitive, you're more reverent, you're more human, you're more passionate, you're more responsible, looked at from any angle. You have come out of this with purity of heart. This pain has made me a better preacher. There are great communicators all around the world, but you can hear the sound when someone's been through something that costs them a lot, but has chosen to turn it into bread to feed others. This pain has made me a better wife made me a better mom. It's made me a better pastor. It's made me a better leader. Because this pain, it drives you closer to the heart of God. It makes you more human. It makes you more reverent. It makes you more responsible. Who wants to stand to our feet? And I think I have the liberty of an extra five minutes. Is that all right? I do feel like, and I wasn't planning this, I feel like there's a little moment we need in ministry today. Because a message like this brings all kinds of thoughts to the forefront of your mind. Some of you are probably in the midst of something that's painful right now, and some of the choices you're about to make are either collateral damage or their personal pain. When I fell on that mountain, because it was my own fault going up on my own. I should have known better. There's a whole nother message in that. But I didn't tell any of my family because it was my pain. I didn't want them to feel sorry for me and ruin the holiday. And I was in one piece. I had no broken bones. So I was like, we're all good. But the next day when I woke up, I was in a lot of pain. Bruising had come out and swelling had happened. And I still didn't say anything. And I went to grab my skis to go out with the family for the day. And when I grabbed them, I guess I winced a little and I didn't know that anyone was near me. And our best friends, the husband of the family, Matthew, he saw me wince. And he came over to me and he said, are you okay? I said, don't say anything. I said, but I took a bit of a fall yesterday. I said, don't tell Steve, don't tell the kids. I said, I'll be fine. He said, okay. I won't tell anybody, but from here on out, I'm carrying your skis. I'm carrying your skis. And can I tell you, there's been some personal pain I've had to take in ministry, but God has sent people to my life who don't need to know everything, who don't wanna tell anybody, but they literally have come alongside me and said, I see, I sense, let me carry you skis. Let me just lift a little bit of the burden off you. Let me just pray alongside you. Let me just come around and encourage you. Let me make a meal for you. Let me ha have you and your family over and let's play games together. Let's do something that is a ski carrying in your world while you heal. And for every one of you right now that feels a little bit like they have personal pain, my prayer for you is that ski carriers will find you. Safe ears will find you. Safe hands 
will handle you for the choice you have made is the choice that God is so pleased with. And I know it's not fair. And I know it costs you. But heaven will record the lives you saved because of the choice you made. So I'm going to invite the worship team to just lead us in a song, if that's okay. And I want to just in this moment, pray over you. I want to be a ski carrier to you before I leave this conference. I want to put strength back in your soul. Some of it's a long time since you laughed. And joy is your strength. Some of you, your marriage is completely stressed out because of this issue in the church. It's affecting your kids. Some of you are not sleeping right because of what it is that you're handling. And I just want to pray today that the God who knows it all and sees it all would help you in this season make the right choices and carry your skis. Father, we thank you that you are here. God, I thank you for this group of leaders. God, I thank you for the journey that each life represents. God, I honor and thank those that have made choices that no one even knows about. And those choices have cost them personally, but they have preserved something for eternity. God, I thank you for the ones that have held back when they had every right to speak up. God, you are the one that bottles our tears. And God, I pray for those right now that maybe have made a collateral damage choice. God, today I pray they would choose this flower in their pocket. God, I pray that they would be the one that would take ownership. I pray they'd be the one that said, I don't want to do this anymore. God, I thank you that ultimately you are our great almighty ski carrier. There's no one that can come alongside quite like you. There's no one that can defend quite like you. There's no one that can protect us and preserve us quite like you. So in this moment of worship, God, I pray that you would minister to the weary and bind up the brokenhearted. I pray to everyone that is carrying the weight of personal pain, that somehow, God, in this moment of worship, there will be a lightness that comes back, there will be a relax that sets in their spirit, there will be a sense of purpose in the pain. God, I pray for healing to happen. I pray for conversations to flow. I pray for flower in every single leader's pocket. God, I pray that this kind of pain would drive us closer to you. Make us more like you. Make us more reverent, more human, more responsible. Oh God, I know that your word says we'll never regret this kind of pain. But God, in the moments when it hurts, God, heal, hold, renew. Now lift your hands to Him, especially you that need help with some skis right now. Just admit it. That's what I had to do. I had to admit to my friend, yeah, I actually could do with the skis lifting. And in this moment, as we worship, I pray a great transaction will happen skis will come off you and peace will enter you pain will become a joy again purpose will be seen again I pray sleep tonight for some of you that have not slept I pray for anxiety in this moment to disappear I pray for a way in the darkness to be seen and found he is the great lifter of our heads so let's lift our hands and lift our heads and let's worship just